Thank you for having me today and to the fantastic organizers who put together this event. As Kathy mentioned, my question today is, can poor farmers increase food security in the wake of climate change? And I am realizing now that it would have been better stated as how can poor farmers increase food security in the wake of climate change? So I'm asking this question today because climate change is already having and will continue to have a profound negative impact on food security. And if we don't address the question of how to address the root causes and solutions to climate change, and we very likely will see in our lifetimes hundreds of millions of more people being pulled into and trapped into poverty and hunger. I wanted to begin with just a few statistics to kind of paint the picture of the dire situation that we are in today. The Nobel Prize winning intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC, has stated that by 2020, just 10 years from today, yields from rain-fed agriculture in some countries in Africa can be decreased by half. This is a continent that's already ravaged by hunger. It's also projected that in Central and South Asia, crop yields could fall by 30% by 2050 because of climate change. And this is mostly due to intense droughts and flooding. Some more studies, the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2005 actually looked more holistically at the developing world and projected that the developing world will likely experience an 11% decrease in arable rain-fed land with a consequent decline in cereal production. They projected, projected that 65 developing countries will lose approximately 280 million tons of potential cereal production. That's valued at a loss of $56 billion. Official scientific projections and statistics are incredibly important, but so is also going to the field and talking to communities and farmers themselves who have been impacted by climate change. ActionAid works in about 50 countries, and we've been speaking to communities of poor and excluded people and doing what's called a participatory vulnerability analysis. And what we're hearing from communities is they themselves identify the loss of crops due to climate change as a key factor in increasing their vulnerability. And they don't necessarily talk in terms of climate change or scientific projections, but they know that the seasons have been changing since when their mothers used to farm and when they farmed when they were a kid to what they're seeing today. I wanted to turn now to look at a specific case study of Malawi where I visited a little more than a year ago. Um, so we could begin to see more specifically how climate change is affecting a country in Africa and how poor farmers there are beginning to adapt, but what else they need to adapt to climate change. So Malawi is a least developed country. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. And like many poor countries, its economy is almost entirely dependent on, or largely dependent on agriculture. So in Malawi, agriculture um, contributes to about 39% of Malawi's gross domestic product. It employs about 80% of the country's labor force. As I mentioned, it's an extremely poor country. 6.3 million Malawians live below the poverty line, mostly in rural areas. And of these poor, more than 90% of them actually rely on the rain to feed their crops. Um, the, Malawi has experienced much more increasingly intense and frequent floods and droughts. And I just wanted to pull out one example of a um, drought in 2001 and 2002 that Malawi experienced, which caused a, what's called a food deficit of about 570,000 tons. The World Food Program had to come into Malawi. Um, 3.2 million people were affected, and the World Food Brand Program spent almost $90 million on emergency food aid, with Malawi, again, an incredibly poor country, having to spend $67 million on its own budget for food relief. Of course, the trickle-down impacts across the society in Malawi, elementary schools were closed, children, increasing numbers of children and the elderly suffering from food and hunger impacts. So this is a district in Malawi called the Salima district. It's in central Malawi. This is where I visited a little over a year ago. And in the communities, ActionAid works through um, local organizations. And the organization we work through in the Salima district of Malawi is called the Salima's Women's Network on Gender, SAWIG is the acronym. Um, you can actually see in this picture, I was there in September 2009. This standing water here is from about April, from some of the most intense floods. Now that water is used for cleaning clothes, for bathing, and for drinking. 
And actually, in the background, it's not a great picture, but you can see a school that had been entirely, almost entirely destroyed by the floods as well. So these are some of the impacts that we're seeing. And again, as ActionAid, an anti-poverty organization, there's no way that we could do poverty alleviation work without taking into effect the impacts of climate change. So SOLWIG, again, is a women's network. It focuses on food and nutrition, HIV AIDS, and violence against women, among other issues. About two years before I had visited, the women in SOLWIG had identified the loss of crops due to climate change as a key factor increasing their vulnerability. Um, so they created a specific program on climate adaptation to increase their crop production in the wake of more intense flooding and droughts. I, they also began to organize women into farmers clubs in different communities, and I met with representatives from five different farmers clubs when I arrived. And I, I was so inspired. They, they joined me, of course, by singing and dance, as I often get greeted um, in developing countries. And the specific song that they were singing were, others are not joining clubs because their husbands are jealous women workers should wake up and join our friends, uh, which, which made me chuckle. But I thought that just the idea of, of adaptation to climate change, it could be you know, raising one's house on kind of stilts, and that's one kind of coping mechanism. But this was so inspiring, because it was about the women coming together to collectively face their challenges, the whole process of empowerment. And um, you could see it through these songs and dance and how they spoke to me. The women were also incredibly organized. Um, every month, three representatives from each farmer's club in the district would come together at Salwig, and they would talk about the problems that they're having in growing food, about different strategies that they're using, what has worked well, what has not worked well, and about other factors that are affecting their daily lives. Um, again, each club would have its own community garden. They would pool resources together, and they would collectively eat some of the food that they produced, and they would sell the rest of their food to the markets. With the money that they earned from the markets, they would pool together to buy seeds and tools, food if their crops weren't growing as well as expected. Um, they also had kind of a revolving loan system, where if a woman wanted to borrow from the pool, she could, but she would have to return it back with 20% interest. Again, this whole idea of farmers' clubs and revolving loans isn't, isn't exactly new. A lot of communities have been doing this in the development process, but I think it's, again, how the women identified themselves what is making them vulnerable, and they've come together to address it that I found was very inspiring. Just to give some more examples, again, this is some of the standing water from the floods uh, the previous April, and the women were using local technology. This is called a trado pump, and you use it like a bicycle to get the water from the standing pool into their crops. So here you see there's kind of a tube, and the, the water flows through the tube to irrigate, in this case, their maize crops. Again, some areas in, Mala in Salima are extremely wet, and some are extremely dry. Just nearby, we visited this community, um, and the women had actually used the resources from their community garden to hire some men in the community to dig this well. The well is already 20 feet deep, um, but they haven't actually hit the water table yet, just to give you a sense of how dry it actually is in that area. This community, the women decided that they actually wanted to plant a cash crop, so they decided to grow c cotton, which is um, quite resistant to both floods and droughts. Uh, women in this community have or have planted um, an organic vegetable garden. In many cases, kind of fertilizers and pesticides are inaccessible to poor communities as they are costly inputs. Um, in addition, the women have recognized that by using compost manure and other organic uh, fertilizers, that they improve greatly the quality of the soil and actually the taste and quality of their food. They did also recognize, however, that more information was needed in how to successfully grow crops um, organically. Again, just another technique. This is a, an area that's been severely affected by floods, and the women in this community decided to grow rice, um, which uses very heavy irrigation. So because of these techniques, the women in Salima told me that they are more food to our today, a year ago, than they ever have been in their lives. And again, there was no technological fix. It was about a pooling of resources and knowledge that brought these women together. 
and let them successfully address the impact of climate change. Of course, there's more that's needed in the community. They've done a great job, but they admit that there's a lot more um, that they could do with more resources. And some of what they themselves identified to me was more information on crop production and particularly food processing techniques, uh, information on drought and flood resistant crops, information on the use and application of compost, manure, better water pumps and technology, and drainage systems. They said, really, thinking big, if money were no obstacle, they would want a windmill to power engine pumps for irrigation. That trado pump, they said, was actually not a woman-friendly technology. It was um, quite difficult to use. Up to a plowing equipment, water harvesting options, and even a campaign at the national level to educate policymakers on climate change. So can poor farmers increase food security in the wake of climate change? I think the answer absolutely is yes but we need to invest much more into the efforts of smallholder farmers to support them in adapting to climate change and to scale up their efforts. So I wanted to end with four key recommendations that are mostly geared um, particularly actually to the, to the US government and policymakers. And the first is really addressing the root cause of the issue, which is that if we're gonna slow the impacts of climate change on food security, we have to halt climate change. And the IPCC that I mentioned earlier has identified that it's absolutely necessary to keep warming from rising two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels um, if we want to avoid the catastrophic impacts. And we're already, with the carbon and pollution that's locked into the atmosphere at about potentially 1.4 degrees, so we're already hitting up against this two degree threshold. So we need to take on very aggressive pollution limits um, if we're going to achieve this two degree limit. The US, of course, is the historically most responsible for creating climate change. Um, and a lot of the responsibility falls in the United States and other developed countries to take on these aggressive targets. I should also say that possibly the saddest irony, tragic irony of all of this is that the poor countries that are most affected by climate change are those that have contributed almost nothing to the problem. And it's the developed countries that have actually caused the climate crisis and now have the responsibility uh, to act. In the United States, it's, it's scientifically projected that aggressive targets of cutting emissions by 40% below our emissions levels in 1990 is actually what's needed by 2020 to keep temperatures below two degrees. Right now, our House has passed a climate bill and our Senate is debating one and we're not gonna come anywhere near, it seems, the targets needed. As important as lowering our emissions are, if we really are going to address this problem, even if we lower our emissions to zero tomorrow, there's still a, a dire need to invest right now in supporting farmers to adapt to the impacts of climate change because the carbon that's in the atmosphere, the pollution is going to stay there and the impacts are going to keep occurring for decades. So there's also an obligation of the United States and other developed countries to dedicate funding for adaptation for developing countries. It's actually estimated by sources, including the World Bank, that adaptation will likely cost $100 billion a year for developing countries. If you think about the United States contributing approximately 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions, that's a bill for the United States for adaptation in developing countries of around $25 billion. That seems like a lot of money a year, um, but if you actually look at our investment in, for example, the bailout of banks, um, in our military investment, that's actually a very small sum. It's really a matter of political will to act through appropriations, through our climate bill, through other innovative means such as taxing, carbon taxing, et cetera, to come up with that money. But more money isn't the only answer. We also have to make sure that money is being channeled through just and equitable institutions to ensure that it's actually reaching poor communities and being used effectively. ActionAid has done a lot of work in following the different climate institutions that manage climate finance, and, and we're disappointed in the performance of many of those institutions, as our colleagues in the developing world are. So one of ActionAid's campaigns is actually to create a new global climate fund that's run by various principles, including representative governance, the participation of affected communities. As we saw, communities know how to adapt. We need to empower them to make decisions on what works best in their communities, creating easy access to funding, et cetera. And fourth, I talked about the additional money needed for climate adaptation, but actually it all, but the United States already is providing 
um, significant development assistance, particularly actually prioritized in our food area. So there's also a need to what's called climate-proof our development assistance to make sure that the investments we're making in food are actually taking into account the long-term projections in climate change. Because we're not thinking about the future and how crops are going to, going to um, be affected by droughts and floods and other natural disasters, then we're going to be doing a huge disservice in our development. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>